All rise. The Court of Appeals Division One is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning. We are here for oral argument in CV 21-0711, Hurtado v. Hurtado. That's correct. All right. Just make sure. As you all may know, we record and live stream these proceedings. So please give your name and the name of your client when you begin speaking for the record. You will each argue for 20 minutes. You are not required to use all of that time, but it is all available to you. You will keep track of your time on the podium. If you'd like to save some time for rebuttal, that is up to you, but you are welcome to try to do so. Keep in mind, we have read the briefing. We've studied the record. We've already discussed the case in conference. And with that in mind, you may proceed. Good morning, and may it please the Court. I am John Zarzinski. I'm appearing on behalf of the respondent appellant, Melissa Hurtado. With your permission, I'd like to start with the spousal maintenance issue. As you know, by studying the briefs and the record, Judge McDowell found that Melissa did not qualify for spousal maintenance under 25319A and any of the five subparagraphs. We submit, Your Honors, that that was error, that there was not significant, that there wasn't any evidence to support a conclusion that she had no qualification under at least three of the subparagraphs. I'll start with 25319A1, which talks about a party seeking maintenance lacking sufficient property, including property apportioned to her, to provide for her reasonable needs. So two parts of that, obviously, are sufficient property and reasonable needs. The evidence at trial clearly showed that she could not, and no evidence was presented to the contrary. Counsel, if I could interrupt you and maybe save us all a little time. Sure. Let's say we agree with you on the eligibility under the A factor. Right. Am I wrong in reading the court's ruling as also determining that she's not entitled under the B factors? I didn't see that. I didn't see any analysis under the B factors. Once the court decided that there was no eligibility under A, there wasn't, certainly didn't go through the 13 factors in B. No, it didn't go through 13, but aren't there findings relative to many of the B factors, or at least four or five of them? Well, I think so, to the extent that they talk about her having the ability to get a job and make some money. Those wouldn't be relevant under the A factors. So what was the point of the court making those findings if it wasn't for saying that it addressed the B factors? Well, it was relevant. It has to be relevant under the A factors. How so? Yeah, because under A2, for example, that's the qualification. Does she have the ability to earn enough money in the marketplace to provide for her reasonable needs? The only evidence at trial on that issue came from Melissa. She said that she is utilizing her community college degree, working at Home Depot in kitchen and bath design, making $17 an hour. Historically, she hadn't worked for eight years, from 2012 to 2020, when the parties physically separated. Prior to 2012, she worked and never made more than $25,000 a year. Her reasonable needs under A1 and A2 of the statute were established by her AFI, her Affidavit of Financial Information. That AFI was never contested. Her expenses were $8,400 a year. And there was no finding by the court that that was an unreasonable level of expense. $8,400 a month. I'm sorry, $8,400 a month, $100,000 a year. How come that that increased so much from her first affidavit to her second? And could the court have considered that? Because in the first affidavit, I think she submitted $2,000 or $3,000, right? As her reasonable needs? Yeah. I'm not exactly sure if I don't have that part of the record in front of me, but I don't know how. I mean, her utilities and rent were higher than that. 
and had been all along. I mean, her, her rent and utilities alone, once she was ousted from the house, uh, was $2,400 a month. So she didn't have enough money coming in from maybe her was, job. I'm sorry, maybe I misspoke. Maybe it was $2,500 less per month. That than could the first be. One. That could be. Yeah. And uh, uh, but but again, that, that's you know one of the one of the things we do in these family court trials is we cross-examine on reasonable expenses as set forth in a AFI. None of that happened. None of that happened. There's no hint from the findings of Judge McDowell that he found her expenses to be unreasonable in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there wasn't any evidence offered by husband that her expenses were unreasonable in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the bottom line was uh, what she got under A1 of the statute in terms of property was uh, a little less than $200,000 in proceeds from the sale of the family home. And then as the answering brief points out, she had $3,000 in a savings account. She had a 13-year-old, or a, yeah, 13-year-old car, I believe, or a nine-year-old car, perhaps. Uh, and, uh, uh, and she had some entitlement to, to uh, retirement, but she was only 42 years of age. So there was no, what, what happened under the analysis of A1 was that the court seem to be equating an equal division of the property as equivalent to sufficient property under A1, sufficient property to provide for her reasonable needs. Um, that, that's, that would never work. I mean, if, if, I mean, every divorce case at least strives for an equal division of community property. If an equal division equaled sufficient property, then nobody would ever qualify under Section A of the statute. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, she didn't. There's, there's no suggestion that she could have, even if all of the $200,000 was available to her for investment, and that's what uh, the, the judge cited Cotter and Potterers uh, to define what constituted sufficient property under A1, and the court quoted that these are assets that are already actively producing income or are capable of being converted to do so, and the only non-retirement assets that she had, and the court found, of course, she doesn't have to use her retirement assets. The only non-retirement assets she had was the 200000 or so in the proceeds from the sale of the home. To cover her reasonable expenses, whether they're, you know, $6,000 or, well, if they're $8,400 a month, that's $100,000 a year, she'd have to get a 50% rate of return. Nobody suggested that. Uh, that the, Did, the assets, do they have to independently cover or is the assets in combination with her earnings? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I don't, I can't imagine that the case law suggests that you ignore her ability to earn and provide for herself at that point, and just focus on the assets. Well, but for, for the limited purpose of eligibility, they, they said they're, they're different. A1 is different from A2. A2 talks about uh, whether she is able to be self-sufficient through em appropriate employment. They could have said in A1 that lacks sufficient property to provide for her reasonable needs and doesn't have sufficient income to provide for those needs, but, but, but they're separate. So your, your position would be A1 would be met any time you don't have the ability to, because these factors are disjointed, if you're eligible in one. So right, your, right. your position would be any time you can't just sit at home and never spend anything except for your assets, you're automatically eligible for well, spousal not, maintenance? Well, no, no, not at all. Okay, uh, so then yeah. it has to factor in the difference. It's the delta. That e we're even if there is a difference, even though that's not the way the this, this statute is set forth, I'll concede for purposes of our argument today, it doesn't matter whether it's some combination of her $2,000 a month ability to earn an income uh, or her uh, return on investment for $200,000 in assets. Combined, she is nowhere close to being able to provide for her reasonable needs. And to equate sufficient assets with an equal division of property, as the decree seemed to do, is error. Uh, it's also error to suggest that her ability, I think the court made a finding that she's capable of self-sufficiency through one of the jobs for which she was trained. Well, <laughs> all that was was the $17 an hour she's making at Home Depot, um, taking every hour that she can and utilizing that community property degree. Uh, 
Um, she testified that, I think she said microneedling, I'm not sure what that is, but microneedling pays $17 an hour, that the dental job that she had back in 2012 makes uh, between $17 and $20 an hour. Um, and I think the other one, I can't remember what the other job was, but the only evidence of what that earned, what she could earn from those jobs, the only jobs that were talked about at trial was her testimony and evidence of $17 to $20 an hour. It's not something Counsel, that didn't she also yeah. talk about um, going to nursing school, yeah. right? Isn't that her goal to, her goal, and, yeah. and so she could, and that she at least suggested that that would be uh, significantly more income, or potentially, potentially yeah. more income. Is that correct? Absolutely, and and that was one of the issues we were prepared to talk about in terms of um, amount and duration under Section B of the statute. Did uh, the court uh, address that nursing no, no. Uh, going back to school or going to, to nursing school and the transition there? No, there's just no discussion about nursing school in the order at all. Um, and, and again, the only evidence as to what the income could be was offered by Melissa. Uh, Carlos offered nothing. Uh, the court made no findings that the income could, could be, you know, $40 an hour, they're, 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 because there was nothing upon which to draw other than her testimony. So uh, it's not something you can take judicial notice of. So she clearly didn't have sufficient property under Section A1. Uh, she didn't have sufficient income under A2, even, in, even if you combine it with A1, uh, to provide for her reasonable needs. And a, and a more detailed Section B analysis for amount and duration was required. Um, the, the other two, I mean, we didn't make a claim under um, A4, which is a marriage of long duration and an, a, and an age that precludes um, uh, significant employment. The court made a finding that it was a marriage of long duration, but we never argued that at age 42 she couldn't enter the workforce, she's not 69. Um, but A3, uh, under, under that, again, entitlement, was a question of whether or not Melissa made a significant contribution to the earning ability of, of husband. Counsel, uh, I don't mean to nitpick, sure. but you, you, you've said a couple times in the context of A factors, entitlement. And I, that may be some of my confusion. Isn't A the eligibility and then B is the entitlement? Well, I, I, I guess I'm equating entitlement and eligibility and I'm making them synonymous. The B factors are to determine amount and duration. They're Which already, could be zero. Could be zero. Yeah, so it absolutely could be I, zero. I think our case law in the past has kind of said that there's a two-stage two analysis. So you yeah. determine eligibility under A and then... And then amount and duration under B. Or if, if any, yeah, if, yeah, any. if, if any, yes, so. and and we think that she qualified under four of the five, not A number, factors, yeah, yeah, under four or five A factors, and that required then an analysis of the thirteen factors under B, but which simply wasn't done. Counsel, is it your position under B that the court is required to consider all thirteen factors and to do so explicitly and in writing? No, I don't think they have to say uh, each and every factor. Um, I, I think they have to acknowledge that the factors are there, but they can say there's no evidence to support factor number 10. So to um, Judge Morse's earlier point, to the extent that Judge McDowell made f factual findings that go to the B factors, although he didn't perhaps explicitly identify them as such, isn't that sufficient, or I guess why isn't that sufficient? Well, I, I, I guess it could be considered sufficient, but if he was going to do a, a Section B analysis, I would have thought that he would have said so, and he, he simply didn't. I'm not sure what he looked at that would fit under Section B. I mean, obviously, reasonable needs comes into play under Section B. That's one of the factors. And there's no analysis by anyone as, as to what her reasonable needs are other than Melissa. So, I, I and I wish I had the site with me. I read, the, read one of our prior cases as saying mm -hmm. the court is required to consider the factors that the parties present evidence on. Right. So, and and make argument on. So, what yeah. what did you argue as far as entitlement below? Well, um, we talked about. And I say entitlement meaning the B factors. The B factors. We talked about the um, 
income that she could receive from her employment, whether that be, you know, micro needling or uh, Home Depot, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, and that was established at 17 and to 20 dollars an hour, and that was un it was uncontested. It wasn't challenged by anyone, uh, and no other evidence of a different number was ever presented. Uh, we then talked about uh, the only assets that she was going to be receiving being the house and how that simply couldn't generate enough of an income to, uh, to significantly cut, you know, to apply towards those expenses. She even testified that uh, because she doesn't have a work history for the eight years that she was out of, that, that uh, any house that she wanted to buy would require an unusually high down payment. Um, so we, we didn't have income from employment and we didn't have income from investments to provide for her reasonable needs. And then what we did was establish what those reasonable needs were. And those reasonable needs were set forth in her AFI. And again, it, it just, they simply were unchallenged. They had plenty of opportunity to say, well, your housing expense is high, your utility expense is high, you, you know, your, your food expense. But none of that happened, not, not one of it. So is it your position then that you did present evidence on all 13 factors? I, I, I think we, I think we provided evidence on all the relevant factors. And I'm not, I don't have all the B factors committed to memory at this point, but we, we, we showed basically income and a shortfall from that income uh, based on her reasonable needs. Let and, me ask you one, and I don't want to, I don't know how much time you want to reserve. No, that's fine. Assuming we're reviewing the A factors, mm -hmm. um, what is our standard of review? Well, it's, I think, an abuse of discretion. I think there, there has to be uh, an abuse of discretion, but that, there's got to be some evidence to support the finding. I think our cases say some reasonable evidence, which I yeah. still don't understand what that means. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm not sure I do. But again, I, I think if we just look at the way it was, the, the analysis was more of a conclusion than it was an analysis. When the judge said, I find that she has sufficient property to provide for her reasonable needs under A1 because there was an equal division of assets, that, that simply is wrong. It's, it makes no sense. And uh, to suggest that uh, she had under A2 sufficient income, ability to earn an income, uh, given the evidence that was presented, there just wasn't any. There, there wasn't, and it, you can't take judicial notice of what a, you know, a, somebody at Home Depot should make or what a, uh, you know, a dental assistant should make. It, the, the only evidence was presented by, by uh, Melissa. It wasn't contradicted by Carlos in the least, and no, no contrary evidence was, was made. So uh, there, there's no evidence to support a finding that she had those sufficient uh, resources, whether it be in the form of uh, income from assets or income from employment to provide for the reasonable needs that she had. So um, any other questions on that? I'll touch briefly on the uh, next issue. Oh, maybe I'll just add this on the third issue in our brief had to do with whether or not there was, it was error for the court to uh, reimburse husband half of the mortgage payments pending sale uh, when he didn't do it during the trial. He said that the, the reasonable um, rental value was, was, uh, was a defense against the reimbursement. Now, I know Farrell came out and there's an argument that Melissa has that uh, she was ousted because both sought temporary use of the home and she lost and she was ousted by a court order. But it, I, I really think the issue is relatively, it, well, it's moot at this point. The uh, parties, or husbands, uh, bought her out of the home, uh, so she received I don't know, 195000 or something. And we've, we're fighting over about 10000 that are in his lawyer's trust account, but the, the fight over those dollars does not include uh, enough of an argument concerning reimbursement to make it an issue any longer. So I, if you just save your time on that issue, you just don't need to do it. Uh, this issue of the uh, book of business, um, I set forth some of the, the testimony about that in the brief at some detail. Uh, basically, I came in late in the case. There was about six or seven weeks left for trial. Okay, I do that, eyes wide open, I know that. Uh, but when I saw that there was no evaluation or even consideration of a potential book of business, 
uh, we went about the business of marshalling her resources to hire an expert, and she did. And then I made the motion to continue. Now, the, Judge McDowell could have just simply said, well, John, I'm sorry you came on late, and essentially discovery was closed, and you know, you could, too late to do deposition. And, and I'm just going to deny the motion to continue, and we're going to move forward. But he cracked the door open a little bit. And he cracked the door open by saying, if you can give us some reasonable grounds to kick that can down the road uh, and, and allow further discovery and maybe further evidentiary hearing, then I'll consider it. The way he characterized it in his ruling was that he left the door open for some evidence to establish that there was um, uh, that, that there was grounds to believe that she did. I'm not going to go over because I'm out of time, but all of the testimony that was set forth was clear from Melissa. She had all of her all of her information came directly from Carlos. Yeah, but he. he... <laughs> This is, he said, she said. He, he says, I didn't say it that way. She says he said it that way. Yeah. Don't we have to just defer to the trial court on that? Yeah, I, I, I think if, if, if the nature of that testimony, which was clear from Melissa and frankly unusual from Carlos, um, if that doesn't rise to the level of some basis for the belief or some reasonable grounds to kick the can down the road, then yes, then, then she's out, out of luck on that. Um, third issue was out, fourth issue I won't go into because I'm I think out you're of out of time, counsel, yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, I stepped on your shoes. Judge Perkins should have been the one to tell you you're out of time. I apologize for that. <laughs> That's fine. Counsel? Well, good morning. May it please the court. I represent Mr. Carlos Hurtado, who is on my right. Um, three issues really, uh, well, counsel addressed today, two issues, spousal and the discovery issue regarding the book of business. With respect to spousal support, um, the standard, as the court was, knows, is an abuse of discretion standard. And it is on, the burden is on the appellant to show that the judge abused his discretion in the way he evaluated the evidence and made his findings. Uh, with respect to spousal, on each of the, on each of the A uh, gatekeeper uh, factors, he went through each factor and articulated why uh, he made the findings that he did. Uh, with respect to the council if i could ask you to focus um on a1 so the first factor yes. and and counsel's your your opposing counsel's argument that the court improperly conflated an equal distri distribution of property with sufficient property pursuant to this statute um it, it does seem like the court said that the wife um, failed to demonstrate that she lacked sufficient property because the evidence demonstrated there was an equal allocation of property. Uh, wouldn't that, aren't those two separate concepts? And, and if so, then the court perhaps made a, a, a legal error in interpreting this um, particular uh, It could be that the judge made a legal error or he used, uh, made an uh, unwise choice of words. He could have probably worded it a different way. Uh, but in this case, he did not. And what he wrote in his decree was, yes, a wife had received an equal distribution of assets, including the 401k. And but prior to make to that finding, he went through the assets and made the allocations, addressed each uh, specific asset. And I believe that when it all everything shook out, wife received over two hundred thousand dollars of the assets, uh, which is equal to what Mr. Hurtado husband received. And let me let me kind of follow up on Judge Perkins' questions, but maybe a little more directly. Um, I think, and I don't speak for all of us, that the court erred and clearly erred in finding that her the distribution of assets is sufficient to meet her needs, at least as the needs is set forth in the in the uh, affidavit of financial need that she submitted and didn't seem to be challenged in the proceedings below. Um, what do we do if we if we if I can convince the other two panel members uh, of this position, what is our remedy and how do we proceed? Yes, 
Uh, certainly, uh, the, the A factors are just gatekeeping functions. And of the five fact factors there, uh, particularly A, it's not very well, in my mind, not very well written, leaves a lot of room for discussion. So in other words, it's a low bar. It's a very low bar, right. okay. uh, unfortunately. I mean, yeah. I'm even wondering why A is even there, because it's not gatekeeping anything, really. Uh, so, but if we all come back to even section A, the, the A factors say that the court may grant spousal, doesn't say, statute doesn't say the court shall grant spousal if any of these gatekeeping functions are proven. And then obviously the, the B factors are the laundry list of items that the court has to consider to, to decide whether to grant anything, and if so, how much and how long. And I believe that when the parties went to trial, they were, they were trying the case on the entire uh, 25319. They were not trying the case on A or trying the case on B. Well, certainly, but, but what do we, where can you direct us in the transcript or in the court's decree where we can have some degree of assurance that the court actually did evaluate the 25, the B factors? Yes. I'm, not, I'm not seeing that so far, so please help me understand where the court said and under 25319B, as to, as to duration and amount, I am specifically finding you're entitled to zero dollars. Where does the court say that? The court didn't say in its decree that it has made B factor findings because the court didn't even get to B because the court says, wife didn't satisfy the, the A findings. In other words, you're saying the court did exercise its gatekeeping function and said, no, don't, no. don't pass, go, right, you're done. Yes, Your Honor, and I'm also saying that, but so then, we, So then, I think, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, you just agreed with us that this was this is only an A case, at least as far as the court's decision. No, no, no I'm, not, I'm not saying that. Okay. But the court heard the totality of the evidence including the length of the marriage, the respective incomes of the parties. You, you just told me that the court found she wasn't eligible under A. Y yes. Okay. So but, then the court didn't do B. Uh, not, not explicitly in the decree, but I believe the, the, the court, there was sufficient evidence in the record that, that the court could have? Could have. Okay. Had, 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 had. So, but then isn't our is remedy, it, yeah. isn't our, going back to my original question, our remedy, isn't our remedy to say, not that you get to retry this case. Court already heard all the evidence and you've told us you guys tried it as both an A and a B case. We vacate, if we think that there's error in A1, we vacate and send it back to the court to apply the A findings or the B findings uh, on the record that you guys presented in the case. Yes, uh, that is, I guess if, if, the appellant, if the appellant wins the appeal, then clearly that would be the appropriate remedy. Um, send it back to Judge I'm, I'm not trying to make you concede A1, but yes. assuming that I'm right that A1 was not, that she met A1, uh, or at least the court erred in, in, in evaluating the A1 factors, that would be our remedy. That would be our remedy is to kick it back down to the trial judge and say, you've heard the evidence, now do the B factor analysis and it would be within the judge's discretion, again, to decide how much and, and how long, if any. And I'm not sure, have the new guidelines come out yet or is that just still pending? Our counsel, are I mean, you aware of the statute's been changed on spousal maintenance? Were you aware I'm not aware that it's been changed okay. as of yet. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if it's effective yet it's or not. It's not quite effective. Okay. If you don't like it, you'll okay. I do, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, and I'm not suggesting, so you're not, just to really clarify your position, you're not agreeing, uh, you're not conceding that the court erred on the on the on its gatekeeping function. Your your position is the court the court did not abuse its discretion under a under the A factors. Yes, yes, sure. But you do yeah. acknowledge that the court did not make a B finding. Not expressly on the record. Yes, okay. he he did not address specifically B. If you want to use your time wisely from here, um, I'm done with the spousal maintenance. These two may have additional questions, but no, you should probably have, respond to the other I don't issues. have anything on spousal no, Thank you. Uh, the other big issue I believe that counsel raised was the issue of the extending discovery to allow 
um, wife to bring in her, her expert to, to analyze the, the book of business. And I think I briefed it fairly exhaustively in our brief. But basically, this is a discovery issue where the judge has said, where one party is asking leave to extend the time for discovery so that they can bring on board an expert to do a business evaluation. Uh, with discovery matters, it is totally within the province of the trial judge to exercise discretion as to whether or not to extend time. In this case, there's ample evidence in the record to support that Judge McDowell was correct in, well, he didn't initially, he actually fully denied the motion, um, but he did say, I'm, I'm denying the motion to continue, but I leave it open to you at trial. If you can come to me at trial with some evidence to support the existence of a book of business, I will consider deferral ruling on that issue, have a supplemental hearing on that. So the defender has been given numerous opportunities to develop their case. Uh, they have known from day one that the book of business is going to be an issue. When they filed their response to the petition, uh, the, def the, the, the wife, so attorney then, not Mr. Zazinski, but the previous attorney had stated um, in the response that that husband owns a book of business and they're entitled to 50%. About, about a month later, the, the parties submitted their resolution statements in which in that statement, husband's attorney, the trial attorney at the time, Specifically stated, husband does not own a book of business. And he's an employee. And then there was some discovery where husband produced over seven inches of employment and pay records to the defendant. Uh, the previous judge, Judge Sinclair, set discovery, cut off, gave, giving the, the, the wife another five or six months to conduct discovery. That was not done until Mr. Zanzinski came on on the eve of trial, six weeks or so before trial. How much does the court's statement matter? And I understand your, your opponent's argument that the court said, well, if you present some evidence, I'll, I'll consider kicking this can down the road. But why does that matter to us what the court said? I mean, it, the court gets to enforce discovery deadlines. It may have said something that, you know, I'm going to reconsider this if you do it. But why, do we, why does that matter to us, that what the court said as far as what, what standard it was going to apply in uh, deciding whether to grant the continuance later? Um, it matters only in that, to show the, to show the court that uh, Judge McDowell didn't just um, cavalierly dismiss the motion to dismiss. He's trying to... But his argument is actually it would have been better if he had cavalierly denied it. And, and I, I, I hate to, especially as an appellate judge, you, you, you don't want to do the uh, no good deed goes unpunished kind of rule. And isn't that kind of what he's asking us to do because he left open this window that we should then kind of punish him for not opening it all the way? Uh, no, he, he did the right thing. He, he basically said deny the motion. You've had time to do it uh, at trial. Uh, there was discussion between counsel and the, and the court as to why records were not subpoenaed from his employer, uh, from Carlos, Mr. Hurtado's employer and his uh, senior advisor to establish is their book of business. Uh, come to find out that uh, counsel had hired an expert and Judge McDowell commented, while well, you're putting the cart before the horse. You, you hired an expert without even knowing is their book of business. Um, so he was within his discretion to just to deny the, the motion to, to continue uh, to allow my wife to do additional dis discovery. Okay. Um, unless the court wants to hear other issues, I think those are the main issues that we address. And her husband is also asking that uh, uh, no attorney's fees be awarded in this case for the reasons we stated in our, in our brief. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments. We will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. The court will stand in recess uh, to reset for the next argument.